pleasant experience when the news comes to you. And oddly enough, it seems to always come at an inopportune time, early in the morning perhaps, or maybe when you're at work or with your friends somewhere where you'd rather not have this to be brought to your attention. Someone has filed a lawsuit against you, and the process must be served. There is a summons that comes from the one who files the suit through the court, and it is delivered into your hands. I know this because I used to serve process from time to time. It's kind of a dangerous occupation, especially in divorce cases for some reason. <laughs> But that's what we have here today in Isaiah's beginning of, of, of the uh, uh, book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet of God, but in this case, he's also a process servant. He brings a lawsuit on behalf of God against God's people. First, there's the summoning of the jury. The natural elements that God calls to be the judge against God's people. The only thing worse than having the process served against you is to find out that God's the prosecutor. <laughs> God is the plaintiff. It doesn't sound like a good situation. And so God calls the jury and God lays out the case that God has against God's people. They are thick-headed and they just don't get how it is that they're supposed to be in relationship with God. In this case, the kingdom of Israel has been divided. We're about roughly seven to eight hundred years before the birth of Christ. And in what must seem to us sometimes like a familiar situation, a once mighty and great nation seems to be to have diminished, have seemed to have lost its way. The once great kingdom of Israel, that, that new greatness in that part of the known world of that time, the, the kingdom that was forged under the leadership of King David and later under, uh, under his uh, uh, predecessor, or rather his uh, antecedents has been divided. Now make no mistakes, there's a lot of, of politics, a lot of geopolitics in the book of Isaiah. And a lot of mixed message. In the north is the kingdom of Israel that has been devastating. And in the south, the kingdom of Judah that also went to war but cut a deal. And in the process, they have, even though they are a vassal state, that is, they are a servant of another king, they have some amount of independence, at least as far as worship goes. And to some extent, as long as they're paying their taxes, they are free to do otherwise as they might choose. And therein lies the problem that God has with the people of Judah. It's because of the choices that they have made. Now, God starts out with a little bit of courtroom rhetoric. If you watch the trials on television, you see sometimes that those opening statements, uh, they, the, the, the uh, attorneys for each side tell the jury what it is that they intend to prove, but sometimes they try to plant some seeds of, of uh, emotion or even prejudice for it against their client. God kind of takes that tack a little bit. God addresses the people of Judah and he calls them uh, people of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah a little bit before? Sodom gets destroyed. Gomorrah suffers an awful fate. And by the way, Isaiah is only one of the prophets who tells us that the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah is not what we've come to think it was. Isaiah echoes Micah, echoes Amos, echoes other prophets who point out what the problem is for the people of the kingdom. 
why God refers to them as a nation that could be destroyed is kind of a warning shot. God is saying to the people of Judah, if you want to turn out like Sodom, if you want to turn out like Gomorrah, keep on your present path. Because that's where we're headed. And God lays out the case against them. They have gotten too involved in thinking that worship is the sole sum total of their relationship with God. They've come to think that if they just get the worship service right, that everything is good with God, they can return to their former favor. Maybe those who uh, have foreign troops uh, occupying their land will be turned away. Maybe God will intervene and rescue us from our current faith. Maybe the great kingdoms will be reunited again by God's hand if we can just get the right formula. And so God points out to them, Look, you have these great worship services. You have these great festivals. You sing all of the right songs. How great thou art. I mean, if you start worship with how great thou art, God's got to be pleased, right? <laughs> how many of you remember when How Great Thou Art first came out? You know what to admit it, right? <laughs> Funny thing is, a song that we now consider to be an old favorite, an old classic of the church, was not allowed to be sung in a lot of Orthodox churches, a lot of very conservative traditional churches, because it was considered to be a popular song. And folks in the pew said, we don't want to sing popular music in worship. We want the good old songs. The people of Judah are singing the good old songs too, but they're the really old songs. celebrate the right festivals and they do the right things in worship. They proclaim their allegiance to God with their words. And therein lies the problem. As God outlines in God's lawsuit against the people, I'm tired of hearing your singing. I'm tired of hearing your great liturgies. I'm weary of your elaborate festivals and your great worship services because I expect more. We do that today too. In churches across the country we have for a long time and sometimes continue to think that the shape of our worship service on Sunday is what shapes our relationship with God. We think if we just get the formula right and sometimes we're not even concerned that it's right with God as long as it's right with us. I want the kind of music I want. I want the minister to wear a robe every Sunday instead of his golf clothes. <laughs> I want the elders to wear their suits. And we should wear suits because they should all be made. I want everything to be the way I think it should. And then we wonder why the numbers diminish. And we wonder why those who have been looked askance when they walked into church with their t-shirt and were told either, either verbally or through body language that sometimes they work out well. And that's God's problem with the people of Judah. They have made the worship service focus of their faith. And so God has warned them that if they keep on this path, they will suffer a fate like Sodom's and like the Mormon. And that's kind of where we left off when Brandon read the first part of, 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 the, of the scripture. We've heard that the case that's been brought against the people of Judah, we've heard the, the problems that God has with their conduct and their relationship with God. And then we kind of let that hang a little bit. And then Brandon comes back again and shares the second part. And as Isaiah will frequently do throughout the book, we'll kind of shift back and forth between a word of warning and a word of omen and shift to a word of hope. 
Isaiah turns around, and, and, and this is where in lawsuit language, the prophet acting as kind of an attorney for God, this is where God lays out what God expects to make things right. In a civil lawsuit, as opposed to a criminal lawsuit, in a civil lawsuit, there's some kind of remedy that's being asked for. It's not just a, it's not just a party that's been wronged. <coughs> But the party is also asking the court to make a remedy that will make the wrong one whole. So what does God ask to have wholeness? What does God seek in remedy for having been wronged by God's people? God asks for a healed relationship with God's people. God wants not only the people of Judah and the people of Israel to be rejoined and that, to, that there be once again a united kingdom under God. But God wants the people to be healed as well. And so just as the other prophets do, Isaiah points to the people of Judah and says, My issue with you is that your actions do not match your words. You come into worship and you praise my name and you lift up your relationship with God and you say, we are the real people of Israel. We are the real descendants of Abraham. We are the real ones who are in relationship with God. Just look at how nicely we sing. Look at how big our choir is. Look how good our organist is. And she is, by the way. <laughs> God says, I don't care about any of that. Because when I look outside of your worship chamber, when I look outside of your sanctuary, what I see are the widows who are still struggling to eat. What I see are the orphans who are still struggling to have a roof over their heads. What I see is the people who are oppressed, not by the Assyrian armies who have occupied, but by your own practices. Because in your prosperity, you have neglected those for whom I care most. And that's the heart of God's lawsuit against the people of Judah. But Isaiah says all is not lost. This can be healed. He says, stretch out your hands. Did you hear Brandon read that? Stretch out your hands. That's an act of prayer. But it's almost as if in anticipation, God sees the people of Judah reach out their hands in prayer. And he says, look at your hands. They're covered with blood. A symbol for the, the wars that have been fought between the two kingdoms. And other acts of violence. And God says, why are you reaching out your hands to me when they're covered in blood? He says, this too can be remedied. Your hands can be washed of their blood. If you turn to me in genuine and sincere prayer, if you turn to me and let your actions be guided by the things you hear and say and worship, when you walk outside of those doors and make your life shape like what you say it is in here, then your hands will be washed clean. And even the worst of your sins can be forgiven. And so the people of Judah, still like 60 more chapters of this, so it's not done yet. <laughs> I'm not going to preach on all 60 chapters today, but get an amen to that. <laughs> but the people of Judah are left with a decision. God is not pleased with who they have been. Who are they going to be? I came here last fall called to this particular congregation. Now I think we're a people, from what I have seen, who do a pretty decent job of making our actions match our words. I'm impressed by this congregation that is so mission driven. not so tied just to worship. We do worship pretty well, too. We're not tied to it. 
But like the people of Judah, sometimes we long for a day that was past. We long for a day when David was on the throne and our armies were mighty and no one would dare mess with us. The country we lived in was undisputedly the great power and the church pretty much was able to get its way in the society by law and by custom. And now we're not sure what the church should be in the new time. And so we start to tackle that. In a couple of weeks, we'll go out to Sylvan Vale again. The church, this congregation, has a custom every year in August of going out to the, to the ranch at Sylvandale and having worship together and fellowship together. And we will also, this year, have some time together in conversation, in retreat together, where we listen to each other. You don't just listen to me or to your leadership. We don't read a book together by some PhD who tells us how to be church in the 21st century. But we come together as a people and we give our opinions and we listen to each other. And we remember not only who we have been, but we look around in our community and we say, what does it mean to be a mission outpost for God in the 21st century in northern Colorado. In Loveland and in Bertha and in Firestone. And even in Estes Park and those other places where we live and work. And we figure that out together. Hopefully not so much in argument as God invites the people of Judah to do with God. But together, hearing each other's voices, we set a path that goes forward. And we set a path where both our worship in whatever forms it takes, and it certainly doesn't need to be more than one, and our mission, the way we use our building to be a mission outpost to the community, and the way we get outside the walls and we do things, in Colorado and in New Mexico and in Missouri and even with our mission partners throughout the denomination across the globe. We figure out what that looks like going forward. And we dedicate ourselves once again to a vision of being God's church and caring for those who need to be cared for. And setting aside so much what it is that we think we should have. And asking more about what it God it is that desires for us. And the lawsuit against us gets dropped without prejudice. And we are made whole with each other. We're made whole with the living God who loves us. And invites us to show how much we love God. I love you. Treasures they couldn't get rid of. They weren't <coughs> to have at their home. 
but they were important enough to keep, so they put all their treasures in the storage unit. Now, fast forward to today, I'm not much of a TV watcher, but I understand there is a TV show called Storage Wars. I haven't seen it. My image of it is people go into these storage units that have been left behind and they find treasure. And then they try to get as much money as they can. Is that kind of the, the idea? So somebody had these treasures. They had to pay, had to put in this storage unit. And then they forgot about them. And they sat there until somebody else came in to find the treasure. Hmm, what does that say about our culture? What does that say about the scripture that was read this morning? So I encourage all of us to reflect on what we have stored more than where we have it stored. What we have stored at, because where our treasures are, as the scripture says, that's where our heart's going to be. That's where our attention is going to be. And what would happen if we sold everything, like the scripture's encouraging us to, and had nothing so that we could focus on God? What gift would God bring to you, to me, if we did that? So just, you're invited to think about that as the Deacons come forward to receive our treasure in the form of the morning offering.